Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'll be your host for today's event, which is titled Electrophysiology of Human Native Receptors in Neurological and Mental Disorders. This webinar has been sponsored by Harvard Bioscience and Multi-Channel Systems, so a big thanks to them for making this event possible. Today, we're being joined by Dr. Achenor Limon, Assistant Professor in the Department of Neurology at the Mitchell Center for Neurodegenerative Dis Disorders at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Dr. Limon will present recent research using pioneering methods developed in his lab, including reactivation and microtransplantation of synaptic re receptors from frozen human brains to evaluate the relationship between synaptic EI ratio and behavioral abnormalities across post-mortem po post intervals and brain banks particularly in subjects affected by Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia. Um, all right, and with that, I'm very pleased to hand things over to Dr. Dr. Achenor Limon. Uh, Achenor, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Liam. Thank you very much, all of you guys, for being here, uh, so uh, for this opportunity to, so I can share some of the work that I have been doing in University of Texas Medical Branch and also I started in University of California in Irvine. So the diving directly on the, on the talk, the overview is going to be the following. So we're gonna talk in uh, of the problem of understanding synaptic dysfunction in human dis dis disorders, how uh, our strategy of microtransplanting synaptic receptor, uh, receptors is helping us to, to to answer some specific questions about the disorders in neurologic and mental uh, alterations. Uh, we will use the information of the microtransplantation to explain how we can uh, use the amplitude of the responses of the ion fluxes through the receptors and how we can integrate, integrate that data with multiomics, particularly transcriptomic and proteomics in schizophrenia. And once we know about the, uh, the excitatory uh, AMPA receptors, is it possible to use this information together with inhibitory GABA receptors, the most abundant inhibitory receptors in the, in the nervous system, to measure uh, excitation to inhibition balance across brain regions in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, so this is the overview. Let me just go to the next. So for the first point of the understanding synaptic dysfunction in human disorders. So in this slide, the point is to show the most prevalent disorders in during development of the human of a human during childhood autism is nearly two percent of the population. Schizophrenia is one percent of the population. Across the life, uh, several people will go through an episode of depression, but in in a large proportion will have a major clinical depression disorder. And this is the most disability condition, a, 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 the, the most important cause of disability across the world. And as we age. We are going to have some uh, cognitive uh, impairment, but in aging people, uh, in senescence, uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most prevalent cause of dementia. So we have all these alterations across the ontogeny of the human. And the important part is that all of them are associated with changes in the electrical activity of the brain. And this electrical activity, as you know, is the one that produces all the thoughts and behaviors that we know. So changes in particular regions associated to the specific behaviors and symptoms of these disorders are going to be important. However, the level of resolution to understand electrical activity problems in each of these disorders, eh, we so far in human, we can only study by imaging or postmortem eh, histology, but very specific alterations at the synaptic level, we don't know. And why the synaptic level is important? Because in this, eh, this is a nice, uh, summary by Pences in 2008, and it's still very re relevant today, that these alterations, they also have in common changes in the dendritic spine number. For example, in the black line, you can see here, the normal individuals have an increase on the dendritic spine number that remember, they are specific, uh, highly uh, showing excitatory synapses. And we have an increase of these dendrites in childhood, and then adolescents start to be a pruning, a reduction of these spines, and then it goes continuously going down across our, uh, our uh, as we age. In Alzheimer's disease, we have a dramatic reduction and in, in old ages, in schizophrenia, a reduction and pruning in adolescence. And in, a, in autism and spectrum disorder, there is an increase in this number of, spine, uh, of elliptic spines 
during childhood. And this number goes uh, or mant is maintained as high levels across life. So all of these dendritic alterations are associated with the specific symptoms of each disorder. But how are we going to study the activity of these uh, of these synapses and how they are in the in the human brain? All other thing that all these disorders have in common is that they are all multifactorial. Autism they have a strong genetic component, but for example, valproic acid they also produce autism or increase the risk of autism. So there is a, a multifactorial event, uh, even for schizophrenia, major depression, and Alzheimer disease, where uh, the toxic oligomers like a, a, a beta and tau are associated with the cognitive problems and the pathology, but also uh, hypertension and diabetes are, are, are seems to be at uh, a risk. And all the factors seem to be affecting the, the course of these disorders. Now, some of these multifactorial uh, alterations uh, have um, dif difficulty to, to have animal models. For example, we don't have uh, animal models that uh, recapitulate completely all the symptoms of the schizophrenia. And in the case of autism, we have animal models that can uh, we can uh, put some of the genes that are at risk, but most of the chromosomes, they have high number of genes that are associated to autism. So that will create a large number of, of animal models. And some of the, the characteristics are recapitulated, but not all of them. In major depression disorder, well, we have some animal models, uh, but again, this is the same problem. And we also have another another uh, a, a, another problem, uh, because for example, in Alzheimer's disease, the last time I, ch I checked last week, we have about 210 models. So having the selection of the animal model that we are going to dedicate our time to trying to understand the synaptic alteration is a hard it's a hard one because uh, not all the same, all the animal models reproduce exactly the same they, or they have the same characteristics. So, and when we do a commitment with our search model, well, uh, uh, we we have to spend a bit of time. So then, uh, uh, that's one of the of the difficult choices to to select animal models. And then there is also the next uh, problem that is the there are conditions where we don't really have any animal models. So there is also strong evidence of the presence of non-demented individuals with Alzheimer's disease pathology. So these individuals, they have a strong pathology of Alzheimer's disease like A, beta, and tau, uh, uh, but this pathology was only found in the post-mortem studies. They always were thought as a control when they were alive. And this is because they didn't show any sign of cognitive impairment. So these non-demented with Alzheimer's disease pathology uh, we don't know why they are protected. So it's, we don't have a way to have an animal model of that. However, we know that the, the characteristics of the neurons in these individuals is very important because somehow they were able to prevent the synaptic dysfunction even in the presence of Alzheimer's disease pathology like A, beta, and tau. So understanding the functional activity of these synapses is very, very important. Now, I'm going to use now two examples. A, a, to, to explain the, what, what is our strategy, schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. So on the left, you have the, uh, M, the MRI of a healthy twin with schizophrenia, and to the right, the twin with, schizo uh, with schizophrenia, identical twins. So you can see now that the genetic is not the 100%, so you have also other environmental or epigenetic changes that affect the cortex or the cortical the cortical region, they increase the ventricles in some people with schizophrenia. And then in the right, you have a healthy brain and an advanced, uh, and in the other side, uh, an advanced stage of Alzheimer's disease. Again, you see an enlargement of the ventricles and a re reduction of the, of the gray, uh, of the cortex, the gray matter. So you see that there are changes, uh, but the symptoms are completely different uh, in both of these cases. So understanding the, the, uh, the, the functional activity is very, very important. Now, we can associate, the, we can um, infer that changes in the cortical, uh, uh, like loss of neurons or change, uh, loss of synapses can be associated with the symptoms. However, in this work from Gell in 2015, you can see uh, the age of the people across, uh, the, if every single dot is an individual, a female uh, uh, or a male, across different ages. And then you have in the 
uh, in the Y, you have the thickness in millimeters of the of the cortex or the cerebral cortex. As you can you can see that across life we are losing uh, thickness of the cortex, and all these individuals are cognitively normal. So we can lose almost a third of the cortex without any significant impact in our daily lives. So cognition is preserved despite substantial cortical thinning along life span. Another thing uh, that is important to remember is that there is brain reorganization and plasticity that can overcome cognitive damage from acute and extensive brain destruction. And this is a work from Klinman in 2019, where he, uh, where she, uh, sorry, where she was uh, uh, reporting us the the half uh, kids and teenagers that re that had received uh, 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 removal of the of the hemisphere, complete hemisphere, and the obviously there was a, a cognitive uh, damage, but with rehabilitation they were able to have um, nearly uh, normal lives, and one of them even have a, a, a graduate studies. So again, if there is a uh, acute event, rehabilitation can work. So that indicates in, in disorders like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease, there is a chronic ongoing event where homeostatic, uh, homeostasis and reorganization and plasticity cannot compensate for those mechanisms. So the question is how to study the functional alterations in the neurotransmitter receptors that are fundamental for neuronal activity and are convergence points for multifactorial disorders. Another problem that we have is, okay, we know that synaptic receptors like AMPA that are the excitatory and GABA that are inhibitory are the most abundant in the, in the brain. And because synapses are out there in those disorders, well, we probably should look at them. Now, we can record the, uh, the, the responses and the ion fluxes of these receptors, and we can, have uh, we can use recombinant. And this has been used for a while, and it has given us a lot of information. They have been fundamental for pharmacology. Uh, a, one thing that has been reported recently is that the, is that the um, there are the structural differences between the native ones and the recombinants when the recombinants are expressed by themselves. And some of the reason is because the native receptors are associated with accessory proteins, for example, TORP, uh, cornichon homologous um, and many other proteins that seems to be necessary for the correct function of the brain of the receptor and some of those proteins actually change antagonist uh, sorry uh, yes antagonist to partial agonist in some of uh, in some receptors when the accessory proteins are there so that's why it's important to to know how these uh, uh, auxiliary subunits are there modifying the function of these receptors there is also the, the, the stoichiometry of the receptor seems to be changing across the, the development of a human, and also they change in different brain regions. AMPA receptors or GABA receptors in the cerebellum are different than those that are found in the frontal cortex or the hippocampus or the amygdala. Uh, so if this, to this uh, uh, brain uh, distribution, we add the accessory proteins and then we add the lipids, then we have some differences that are important and we are not taking into consideration when we only uh, express recombinant without the other accessory proteins. Uh, and this is only in health. So when we go to disease, we, we have changes in lipids like cholesterol, epigenetic changes that uh, so we don't really know what are happening in the microenvironment. And that's why it seems to be important to know about the native receptors. So our strategy for that was one that is a, was developed originally by Ricardo Miledi, and it was used uh, for uh, to study fish initially, initially like torpedo fish, uh, to have membranes. So we have modified that a bit to, to now uh, transplant synaptosomes. So then we are focusing only uh, on uh, principally, not only, but principally on the synaptic receptors. So for this method, what we use is brain tissue, and the brain can be fresh from surgical resected tissue, or uh, what we use the most is uh, brain frozen from brain bags. So we can have a piece of the brain, and depending on the type of the question we want to answer, we can focus on a, like 50 milligrams of two half large amounts, or we can even go to single slices in a cryostat to isolate synaptosomes. Uh, we use 
Simper, that is a very uh, a commercial brand that gives us some uh, consistency. And then we homogenize very mildly and centrifugate. So we collect the, like, the synaptosomes and then we uh, create proteoliposomes by doing sonication and creating a small proteoliposomes that, that are around 50 nanometers and 100 nanometers. These uh, proteoliposomes contain the lipids that where these receptors were coming from. So these are the brain lipids. And these receptors were, were working in the human brain when they were there. So these proteoliposomes contain these synaptic receptors, and then we inject it into Xenopus oocytes. We do that because the Xenopus oocyte is one millimeter in diameter, it's very large. We can uh, inject in a particular region. We prefer to inject in the animal side. Um, and we, uh, we can have hundreds of, of Xenopus oocytes from, from a single frog. And then once we injected these proteoliposomes, they fuse with the membrane of the oocyte immediately, very fast. So the fusion starts to happen one hour after the injection. And then about 18 to 24 hours, we have a plateau of the, the responses that is very stable. And then they start to go down uh, the responses across different days. Um, once we have this cell, and we injected these proteoliposomes, then we are providing an environment uh, that is alive. So we have now a differential potential, a resting membrane potential that can allow the flow of ions in this in these Xenopus. And we go for a, a very classic method that is the two electrodes voltage clamp. So when we in, put two uh, uh, electrodes inside, one is going to detect the voltage of the cell, the resting potential, and or the voltage that we want to, to fix. And then the other is going to see the changes of current. So in the way that when we apply the drug uh, or the agonist that we are wanted to study, then we're going to have a response of those receptors that were working in the human brain. To the right, you can see the a typical response to one millimolar GABA. And, the, and I think the cool thing is that in here is that when you apply GABA and then you see a response, what you are actually activating is GABA receptors. And an important point here is that the Xenopus oocytes, they don't have endogenous GABA receptors or AMPA receptors or kinase receptors. So when we are having a response to GABA, that means that the receptors are, that the response is coming from human receptors that were transplanted. And once we have that, then you can measure different electrophysiological parameters like amplitude, activation, the sensitization, and pharmacology and so on. This is how it looks. This is a cross-sectional uh, cut of a, of a Xenopus oocyte. The white triangle indicate it's just to represent an electrode, uh, sorry, a syringe, a glass syringe that deposits uh, about 50 nanograms of protein, uh, equivalent of protein into the oocyte, uh, in a single oocyte. And then the, the membranes were labeled with FM464 that allows the uh, the dye to be inserted into the lipids. You can see how we have a deposition here where there is a, a the tip of the, of, the, uh, of the needle, the pipette. And then they start to fuse with the membrane and start to have lateral diffusion. In the right, you're seeing uh, another oocyte that was injected with alpha, with, uh, sorry, with torpedo membranes. Torpedo membranes from the fish, they have high concentration of nicotinic receptors. So we added alpha bugartoxin labeled and you can see that the bungalotoxin is not permeable, so it's going to bind only from the outside part. Uh, and you can see how these nicot nicotinic receptors that were transplanted are in the surface of this Xenopus oocyte, indicating that the receptors are there, are in the correct position. And then if we add uh, nicotine or a steel choline, we can measure actually the, uh, the amplitude of responses. So just going then now directly to the, to the next step, this is how we uh, have a, a strong quality control of the synaptosomes. We, we do also electron microscopy. You can see to the left how we, uh, the, with the simple preparation, we have in enrichment of synaptic, uh, synaptosomal proteins like PSD95, that is an anchor protein for excitatory receptors. We have the pre and post synaptic densities. And once we have that, again, we just sonicate to break up these synaptosomes. They release the, in, the soluble proteins that they have there and and then we can transplant the receptors in smaller proteoliposomes. The, then you have the responses. These are typical responses that we can observe in those xenopus. We have uh, 
to the uh, to the left we have the response to GABA, which is the classic is activation and sensitization. Then we use kinase to activate AMPA receptors, and the reason is because we are interested in measuring uh, consistent results across individuals. Uh, we use on we try to use the less number of agonists. So glutamate receptors have a strong activation, but also have a strong desensitization. So in order to measure AMPA receptors, we need to apply drugs like cyclothiazide to keep them active and we are able to measure. So we, have, we use kinet because it's only one drug and keeps the receptor open for longer period of time so we can measure it in a consistent way. In the next slides, I'm going to show how the responses to kinate and AMPA receptors are very similar. And the, at least in our experiments, the contribution of kinate type receptors is very minimal because when we use an uh, potentiators of kinase receptors, we don't see responses or increasing the responses. So kinase resp res uh, responses that we have here are mostly from AMPA receptors. And then we also have, a, if we apply an MDA plus glycine, we have an MDA responses. You can see the differences in, this, in the sizes. GABA receptors are the most abundant, followed by AMPA responses, and then the smallest ones are NMDA, NMDA receptors. We also have, uh, have a calcium channels that can be uh, uh, observed by voltage protocols. Because we have the responses, we can also uh, test drugs of clinical importance. Ketamine is a very uh, important drug for drug abuse, anesthesia, but also is very important for major depression disorders. And you can see here, uh, and in schizophrenia for, uh, because it's associated to psychosis. So you can see here by, because all these responses are exactly in the same oocytes, so we can, take ratios one to another, for example. And you can see now that ketamine, uh, it's from just from the data uh, that I'm showing here, is a specific, and it's well known, but it's a specific for NMDA receptors and doesn't do anything for, for GABA or AMPA responses. So this is very convenient because it's everything in the same oocyte. So how we use this information now to understand a a large amount of data that has been consistently obtained from many laboratories in the world uh, that uh, might mean that uh, proteomics, transcriptomic, and other omics data sets. So in schizophrenia, we know that there is a low of spine density. This is a classic now uh, uh, result from Glantz and Lewis where they show uh, in the top panel that there is a control case with a, with a well and healthy number of of its dendritic spines. And in the two panels below, we have a, a one individual who is schizophrenia and a second one below. And you can see from this work from Glantz and Lewis that the, there is a dramatic reduction in the number of spines. So that in, will indicate that we have a reduction in the input of excitatory, uh, uh, the number of excitatory inputs to the dendrites in these neurons. Um, so then, what we did to understand the function of the changes that may happen there, because uh, we know that there is dendritic spine, but also we know that there is homeostatic changes. So how are we going to know what are the changes that are happening in the, in the schizophrenic brain? So for these experiments, we did, uh, we used 10 controls and 10 schizophrenia, three females and seven males. And you can see that was, there was no difference in age. There was no difference in postmortem interval. And we also measured pH and we also measured the RNA integrity number. There are differences in both of them. Actually, schizophrenia seems to be better, uh, RNA integrity number. And there are some differences in the pH that is being uh, has been shown in other studies by other groups in, uh, also, and uh, not only us. Uh, so this, we, take, we took frozen dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and uh, Mark Vader and the, from University, University of California um, and Dr. Machiar, they, they did RNA sequencing from this bulk RNA sequencing. And we also did a, a, a synaptosomal preparations enriching a, like P2 fractions using SIMPER. And from the same aliquots, we did a micro, a micro transplantation of synaptic membranes and uh, the, the same aliquots, or aliquots from the same preparation were sent to the Royal College of Surgeon and then David Carter and Melanie Falk and they did label-free um, mass spectrometry proteomics. So then this was done to be able to correlate the electrophysiological responses with the proteins that were responsible to generating those electrophysiological responses. And the RNA sequencing was done because then we can use this information to see how this correlate 
to the bulk of the RNA sequencing that is uh, highly abundant in many studies in schizophrenia or in mental disorders studies. I'm going to, rest to summarize um, a lot of work in this slide, uh, but I think it's going to be uh, informative. In UCR, so then we have the RNA sequencing, and the idea is in RNA sequencing, you have a list of genes that you can associate to gene ontology to important pathways that are a, a being affected, upregulated, or downregulated. So here I'm showing you from this work that is uh, we published in 2000 in 2020 that genes that are were that were upregulated in schizophrenia were mostly associated with chaperone mediated protein folding, glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway, intrinsic apoptotic, apoptotic signaling pathway, and inflammatory responses. So that uh, so many of those have been uh, also shown in other studies. So then it, then this is confirmatory basically. And in the down uh, genes that were downregulated, and remember this is bulk RNA. Uh, what we observed was uh, the, that synaptic signaling, synaptic proteins were downregulated in schizophrenia. Transmitter across chemical synapses was downregulated. So this indicates, okay, yeah, the alterations in synapses in the dorsolateral peripheral cortex is an important part of the uh, of the of the uh, etiology of schizophrenia, and it goes in the same line with the loss of dendritic spines in schizophrenia. Now, what, what about the synapses that we are uh, obtaining from those? Uh, so the proteonic, the proteins that were upregulated in, in schizophrenia, well, there were some pathways that were increased, include, including some uh, autophosphorylation, the ERF pathway, and, and, uh, and then the proteins that were downregulated were a little bit neurotransmitter uptake, tissue regeneration, and some other like elder team that has to be with the seroplasmin expression that has been also find uh, 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 altered in other, in other uh, studies. So this indicates that like using proteomics itself, because we are using as a background, the proteins in these synaptosomes, well, we are not probably having a strong resolution to see the gene down that are down related in schizophrenia. And that is because probably homeostasis are an important part of the of the compensatory changes that are happening in schizophrenia. So but we have the information on how this correlates with the electrophysiology of the receptors. Well this is um, uh, to the left you can see uh, Tommaso uh, Cepillo. He is um, he right right now he's in the max plan but he did the master uh, uh, studies with me. He's in the international master of uh, uh, international master of neuroscience in the University of Trieste in Italy, and he went to UTMB to do the, his experimental work. So he, what he did was to transplant uh, again receptors from these patients, uh, sorry, from these uh, subjects, and then you have here now the responses to kinate in control in one oocyte control, it, and then in one oocyte transplanted with membranes from the from uh, from a subject with schizophrenia, so there is a down, there is a uh, lower response so to kinate in the schizophrenia, and then this was significantly lower in the schizophrenia group. Every single dot here is an individual, and every dot represents the mean of um, of at least uh, th this was at least uh, six xenopus oocytes, but the number most all the time was ten xenopus oocytes. Um, across different experiments. So this is only the mean. And we are taking the mean, uh, or only one value for each individual to make this analysis of comparison. So as a group, there was a down regulation of this. But because we have the receptor, we also can do those responses to so concentration response curves. Uh, here we are showing the classic response. And in purple here, we are saying, we're seeing the mean, and the thick line is the mean of all the responses in schizophrenia. And in blue is the mean of all the responses in control. The, th the thinner lines indicate single curves. So we have very close, so the, the, the individuals with the schizophrenia seem to have less sensitivity, but it's very close everything in, in reality, but there is a trend. Uh, there are individuals that have lower sensitivity dramatic, as you can see in, with the arrow. Uh, this individual was shown later by proteomics and RNA sequencing that had alteration, strong alterations with uh, with uh, the accessory protein TARP8. Uh, so we have now uh, the, the, the responses. So how these correlate with the proteins that are in charge of 
generating those, resp those responses or that, that, that are in the synapses. So the, in these three panels on top, you see the AMPA responses, uh, the amplitude of the AMPA current in nanoamperes. So we're using here just raw data. Um, so this is the amplitude in nanoamperes. Uh, and then to the in the X, we are seeing the, the, the again, the raw data from the proteomic, the, pro, the proteins that were found in these preparations. Again, every single dot is a single individual. In purple, you have the uh, the, the individuals, the the controls, and the and the schizophrenia. Uh, you can see that they are proteins that are strongly correlated. And as in the it, in the most right panel, you actually see in GRIA3 that is an uh, the, the we are using here gene name for the proteins. So this GRIA3 is the gene that produces, the, uh, uh, well, if this is, the, the, we are using the, the name, but these are the proteins. So this is the protein that produces the GLUA, GLUA subunit AMPA3 that is mostly expressed in, uh, in, uh, with GLUA, GLUA2 uh, AMPA receptors. So there is a, 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 a correlation there. So the proteins that actually correlate with the amplitude of the responses are ribosomal proteins that are in the, in the local synthesis of, of proteins in the, in the synapse, external mem membrane mitochondrial proteins, inner membrane mitochondrial proteins, and of course, AMPA receptor subunits. Here we have the AMPA2 subunit, AMPA3 subunit, and the uh, CAC NG8, that is the gene for TARP8. So this is showing us that accessory proteins are part, uh, highly correlated with also with the other subunits, and they participate in the, they are correlated with the amplitude of the AMPA receptors. Uh, we also find proteins that are negatively correlated with AMPA receptor current in these synaptosomals. And those, those proteins that are uh, downregulated are associated with traffic, folding, and signaling of proteins. So this is a circus plot. To, uh, in the right, we have a circus plot that is based on the uh, that is based on also the data of the gene of list and the the gene ontology. So to the left, you have the genes that are downregulated in schizophrenia and proteins that are downregulated in schizophrenia. So in the right, you have the circus plot, and then you have the length of the inner circle, the orange inner circle, is the no is associated is, well, it actually represents the number of proteins or genes that are up or down regulated in schizophrenia. So the, the longer the, the circumference for that list, the longer, sorry, the longer the, the list, the longer the circumference. Um, so you can see that there are more genes down regulated in schizophrenia compared to the genes, so that compared to the proteins uh, that are down regulated in schizophrenia. Now, the blue lines indicate the pathways that are shared between the proteins and the genes in, in these gene ontologies. And the orange ones are the, the specific genes that are the same as the protein. So you can see that only genes that are down-regulated in schizophrenia, there are about three are producing, are also found down-regulated as a protein in schizophrenia. There are no more, uh, there are not other uh, overlaps between the proteins uh, that are up in schizophrenia and the genes that are up. There are, however, there are some overlap in the pathways between these proteins. So, so this is what we have when we have normal data in, at the omic level. So when we include now the, the proteins that are negatively correlated with AMPA responses in schizophrenia, for example, or we can include also the positive ones, this is what we found now. So you can see that the, pro, that the genes that are down in schizophrenia, remember those were the synaptic ones, were down in schizophrenia, they are also producing proteins that are down in schizophrenia. And which proteins are those? Well, actually are proteins that are part of the sustaining the function of the synapses, AMPA receptors, um, accessory proteins, and some other proteins that are important for function. So you can see now the overlap between the proteins that are down and the amplitude of the responses is very large. So using only one subunit or only on using only one gene ontology is not going to be completely representative of the whole pro of the of the function of the receptors. And now when we go to the proteins that are up, we actually see that proteins that are up in schizophrenia 
are strongly correlated with negative amplitude, with proteins that are uh, negatively correlated with the AMPA responses. And the number of pathways that are, uh, that are correlated are actually increased. So using this information now, we can, uh, we can see which uh, pathways are strongly overlapping. And in the, in the right uh, table, it's just uh, so, uh, seeing, this is one of the pathways that is strongly associated in schizophrenia. And it's MAP K3. It has, been, it has been shown by many studies. But the difference now is that we can provide with electrophysiology uh, some directionality of these pathways because MAP K is associated, is associated with the function of the synapses. But if it's up, if that is going to be associated with an increase or a reduction of the synapses, it's not well known. Uh, so by you doing the electrophysiology, now we can, we can see that MAP K is increased and that increase is correlated with negative uh, uh, responses in, um, in, in, in the AMPA receptors. Here you're, we are seeing all the genes that, and the proteins that were involved in this pathway and, the, and how we, we get information from the RNA sequence, the proteomics, and the, the microtransplantation data. So for this part, so AMPA receptor from frozen brains can be reactivated and recorded by two electrode voltage clamp. The amplitude of synaptic receptors current correlate with synaptic elements at the proteomic level, and the function of receptors provide global directionality to signaling pathways that are commonly found altered in brain disorders. So now, to finish, excitation to inhibition balance across brain regions in Alzheimer's disease. So how is the EI balance in brain disorders? EI balance has been, found, uh, has been proposed as a mechanism for many brain disorders. And the reason is because uh, for every excitatory input that we have, we also have proportional contribution of inhibitory. And this is important to maintain the, the ability to, of the neurons to fight action potentials. This is a very nice study from Bor Barral and Reyes on the, on the right bottom panel that you have uh, that the amplitude of responses of the synapses is correlated or depends on the number of connection. The lower the connection, the higher the amplitude. The, the, low, the, the higher the connections, the less the amplitude is needed to maintain the, the activity. So when we have in Alzheimer's disease reduction of the spines, uh, so we are expecting that we have lower excitatory inputs. However, uh, by this correlation, we also find that if we have a lower, lower um, uh, synapses, there will be compensatory changes increasing the amplitude. So what's going to happen? We, because in Alzheimer's disease, some of the drugs that seem to be beneficial, at least temporarily, are antagonists of NMDA receptors. So indicating that we have a little bit of an excess of glutamate receptors. So just having lower number of synapses uh, may not be uh, measuring just by the histology, may not be completely informative of what we have. So then what we did to, to answer that question is to do uh, different studies. Uh, so can, can we measure, can we use MSM, so microtransplantation, to measure global excitation to inhibitory balance? So this is Pietro Scaduto. He finished his, his graduate studies last, uh, in October, and he moved to the University of Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, he did, uh, in some of his experiments, he measured the excitatory to inhibitory receptors in, in humans at different postmortem intervals. And you have here in the left uh, the responses to GABA and Kynet in in, in uh, samples that were kept at morgue temperature at four degrees for different uh, post-mortem intervals before the tissue was frozen. So you have, you see that uh, we stopped at 87 because we thought the tissue was not going to be viable at the time. However, at four degrees, uh, when we measure up to 87 hours, we still see responses. We have a reduction of the amplitude of GABA and a reduction of kinetic, and we see some changes on the kinetics. So they seem to be slower. However, the amplitude of the responses is there, and importantly, kinate and GABA receptors are degraded similarly, equally. So when we take the ratio one to the other, there is not much variation. So to the right, we are seeing the postmortem interval and the ratio of the kinase response over the GABA response, and we can see that it varies, but in a very narrow range. So that means that it's consistent, uh, the EI ratio across postmortem intervals. Then in Alzheimer's disease, uh, we know that there is a beta and tau, pathology. Uh, so we, we uh, wanted to basically measure the, the function in a, in a region that is known to be 
highly excitable in an Alzheimer's disease. So here, this is the, the parietal cortex uh, in the left, where there is in, in one of the areas that has been found early affected in imaging studies, uh, where it, there is the deposition of A beta amyloid. And in the right, this brain region uh, is part of the default mode network that is active when we are daydreaming. And it's important that we shut down this brain region when we are trying to focus so we can actually generate memories and we can fo focus on the, uh, on the test at hand. So in young subjects, this area can be shutting down very fast and very easily. When we get old, uh, this region has some troubles shutting down. But in people that is A beta positive and is old, this region actually doesn't shut down, it paradoxically increases. So there is hyperactivity in this brain region. So we take now uh, from the parietal cortex of different subjects, we take slices of this tissue and we did a, in, in collaboration with a, a Gary Lynch, a Christine Gold and Julie Lautenborn, fluorescent deconvolution tomography. Uh, and I will explain in a bit. And then we also did from another slide, the synaptosomes to microtransplanted. In fluorescent convolution tomography, the idea is to do immunochemistry and then only measure the immunofluorescence in a volume that is specific for a synapse. And then you do this in a 3D reconstruction and then you count around 3,000, 3,000, uh, no, sorry, 300,000 synapses for every single individual. You have here in green the PSD95 anchor for excitatory proteins and in, in red the GEFRAIN anchor for inhibitory proteins, control Alzheimer's disease. So by doing fluorescent convolution tomography, we can focus only in the synapses and we can forget about lipofusion events or uh, large uh, atro uh, atrophic dendrites and things like that that are very large. Then in this slide, I'm showing, I'm showing the intensity, uh, the immunofluorescence intensity uh, for the PSD95 in layer two and gephrin, and you can see that they follow a normal distribution. And in Alzheimer's disease, and we also include Down syndrome because Down syndrome, they also have a, uh, an increase of ATP that will produce Alzheimer's disease, uh, is, uh, increases the risk of having Alzheimer's disease in, in Down syndrome. However, the, the, the etiology of the disorder in Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, they have different time onset. Uh, you can see that in Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome, there is a reduction in the intensity of the PSD95 layer. But in, Gef in the Geffrey case, you have also an intensity reduction, but also a, a reduction on the peak of the Geffrey compared to the, uh, to the control. So by taking the ratio of the PSD95 over Geffrey, we can see that in Alzheimer's disease, there is an increase of this ratio. And in, the, in Down syndrome, there is all over the place. So it's not significantly different compared to the control. Then by directly measuring responses, we have here a control, uh, an oocyte, uh, just a representative of a control, GABA, kinate, and this is a slide where I'm showing the response of AMPA plus cyclothiazide. In the Alzheimer's disease, the responses are smaller. In Down syndrome, we actually have very strong responses, even sometimes larger than the controls. But all the responses you can see are highly correlated. If you have uh, an increase in, in GABA, you also have an increase in, in controls. So when we take the ratio one over the other, there is very small variation in the controls and in Down syndrome. And in Alzheimer's disease, we have an increase of this ratio that is significantly different. That follows in line with the, goes in line with the, um, uh, the fluorescent convolution tomography. So in this slide, we also went to look for other regions. We follow the frontal cortex because there is hypoactivity in this brain region in, in functional MRI studies, then the temporal cortex and the hippocampus, where those regions have been studied uh, for a quite a bit of time in many, many studies. So we have more data to compare. Uh, so, so this is the global excitatory, excitatory inhibitory, inhibitory balance in, in health. We have controls, controls, and controls in, in, the, in different brain regions. And you can see that there is a variation, very narrow in the in every region, but also in other, uh, there is some differences depending on the region where you are recording. Parietal frontal cortex, they are very similar, but the medial temporal cortex have an increase on the on the risk ratio. And hippocampus is all over the place, suggesting that the sampling of this particular brain region is complex, and also it's very heterogeneous. In, we did some experiment, some analysis, and we showed that excitatory uh, uh, inhibitor is very diverse in the in the hippocampus in RNA sequencing, but also uh, maybe the heterogeneity can be 
affecting these results. When we took the AI ratio in Alzheimer's disease, you see an increase of this AI ratio in Alzheimer's disease as we showed before. In the frontal cortex, we also in, uh, show uh, these people that has this non-demented with Alzheimer's disease pathology that are cognitively normal, we didn't find difference with the control. Uh, so Alzheimer's disease was all redu reduced compared to those. And uh, this is preliminary data that we are putting in for a, for a publication soon. But in the middle temporal cortex, this is one of the regions where the excitatory to inhibitory ratio is highly, highly increased. Because we now know that uh, gephrin and postsynaptic densities that are correlated with responses are representative of the of the AI ratio. Then we use data from the Allen Institute, the Aging, Dementia, and TBI study, to just focus on the DLG that is the gene for PSD95 and gephrin that is the gene for obviously gephrin, and we take the ratios one to the other. We observe that in Alzheimer's system that there is an increase in this transcriptional AI ratio in the parietal cortex, and this increase in the ratio is by reduction in gephrin, not by increase on DLG4. The AI ratio measured like that is highly correlated with the post synapses. So it's indicative of what is happening. And then uh, we measure in those same subjects, we have, uh, the, the Allen was very nice to provide the, uh, the in hybridization in situ and to measure excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And as you can see here, uh, we have the cells counted by this way, and there is a reduction in GAT1 mRNA in the, in the number of, of cells, in the density of cells, there is a reduction in interneurons basically. So the cellular EI ratio measuring the number of excitatory neurons to inhibitory neurons is increased in Alzheimer's disease. And actually, the transcriptional EI ratio of the postsynaptics correlates very nicely with the, with the cells. And the, the correlation is driven by the, basically by Alzheimer's disease. So this is very, uh, this tells us that in, in Alzheimer's disease, the parietal cortex and temporal cortex show a strong loss of excitatory but also inhibitory synapses. The impairment of synapses is unequal, leading to increased transcriptional, anatomical, and functional EI synaptic imbalance, and also cellular EI imbalance. So pro-excitatory imbalance in Alzheimer's disease may explain the hyperexcitability observed in the default mode networks, which at early stages interferes with encoding of memory and promotes activity-dependent release of A-beta and tau oligomers. This is to show that, well, we did schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, a little bit of experiments, just focusing on the amplitude, so there are many brain banks in the United States and many, uh, many uh, that have a tissue stored for many disorders. So there is a lot, a large uh, field of study. I'm going to stop right now, uh, just thanking the National Institute of Mental Health and Aging for the support, the Grass Foundation that helped me to do the first experiments in actually squid. So I, I did my synaptosome in squid quite a bit of time. Tommaso, Pietro Scaduto, Kevin Shane that were part of the, of the work that I presented now, Julie Lauterborn, at Officer Kayla Mark Barrett at UCI, David Carter at Melanie Falcon at Royal College of Surgeon, Dirk Kinney at University of Washington, and my collaborators, Yuri Telatela, Rex Kayedan, Balaji Krishnan, and UTMB. And thank you very much. Now I am open all for your questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Akinor, for the really fantastic presentation. All right, let's jump right in here. Uh, so, Akinor, aside from GABA and AMPA receptors, what other kinds of receptors uh, can you measure with this methodology? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the question. So the uh, we can measure NMDA receptors, uh, voltage-gated calcium channels, and it depends also on the abundance of the receptor that you are interested. The chloride receptor, sorry, chloride uh, uh, channels have been uh, transplanted, chloride transporters have been transplanted, and um, uh, it, what is important is the is that the in the the, the oocyte they don't so the receptor that you're interested in is not uh, present in the in the synopus oocyte. And if there is, then you need to knock it knock it down or, uh, or block it so it doesn't interfere with your receptors. Uh, nicotinic receptors, when they are very abundant, for example, for, from uh, from uh, torpedo fishes or other uh, structures like that, can be can be uh, transplanted. Uh, metabotropic ones, it's a, it's a tricky one because metabotropics will depend uh, the response of the metabotropic receptor will depend on the cellular type that, that is. So in this case, the cell is an xenopus oocyte that will produce some uh, uh, interpretation that may vary. And also the xenopus oocyte only has the IP3 system. So the AMP cyclic is, is not going to be viable to work here. However, if for the IP3 system, uh, if you want to see some of the coupling, it seems to be working well with uh, 
metabotropic glutamate receptor. Yeah, those are the mostly the ones. And but there are many receptors that have been actually there are groups that are very successful transplanting sodium channels and also uh, potassium channels. But sodium channels have been transplanted and also even from different tissues. Uh, uh, in insects for uh, pesticides is a very nice group working on that and the uh, cell cultures uh, I think the important part is that you can extend the work that you are doing let's say that you have cell cultures because I was looking at people that have cell cultures or animal models on past climb. so you can have the cell culture and if you're finished with your experiments then you can recover the cells and, and freeze them and then isolate synaptosome from your cells to record the whole the, the global and average population that you have there. Fantastic, great answer. Um, this question came uh, near the start of your presentation when you're talking about the micro transplantation. Uh, but Akhador, how do you ensure that the receptors are integrated in the right direction inside out and not on the out, uh, not with the outside to the oocyte inside? Uh, or is it just by chance that you activate only the correctly inserted ones? Yes, that's correct. This is a yes. That's a, that's absolutely correct. So, by when you we are doing the the sonication, we are breaking up these proteoliposomes. So, how they're going to seal off again? It's going to be a little bit by chance. Uh, so, the, some of the receptors can be some of the proteoliposomes can be sealed again with the inside out or the outside in, depending. So, when we inject them, all of them are going to have the same probability to 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 fuse with the membrane. So. Because the ones that are with the agonist side in the wrong direction, meaning inside the cell, uh, they are not going to be activated when we put the agonist out from, out, from the outside. Uh, so that's basically it. The, the chance of fusion, people, uh, it's Antonio Morales, he did some experiments a long time ago with the torpedo and other uh, nicotinic. So he found that the chance is around 50 50. And he did that by using titration and then uh, very uh, demanding experiments to see that. So we are just uh, relying on the uh, that we are uh, recording only the ones that are correctly inserted by using uh, extra extracellular perfusion. Another possibility will be to do by layers, for example, so you can control both sides. Uh, but we are just measuring the ones that are correctly in the correctly in the membrane. Fantastic. Um, all right, here's uh, an interesting question. So uh, the Incidence of Alzheimer's disease is different uh, between women and men. Uh, an estrogen mm -hmm. treatment may protect against Alzheimer's disease in aging women. Uh, this person also says that estrogen upregulates AMPA-R, induces dendritic spites, etc. So uh, do you know, how does the endocrine milieu figure in your interpretation of these results? Well, yes. Uh... This, uh, this is a very important question. So we are not getting to that part yet. And that's why I think it's important to now use the, the integration with other data sets, like uh, transcriptomic, proteomics that contain that information. Our question right now is uh, very straightforward, just trying to measure the excitation in inhibition. And the reason is that regardless of what is happening, that is multifactorial here, so we have many, many homeostatic, we have the, patho the pathology and the etiology, and we have the homeostasis uh, changes. And the ultimate uh, outcome of this, in, at least on the synapses, is, a, is the relationship between the AMPA and the GABA res responses. So right now we are only measuring those amplitudes. We are not even going into the, the different kinetics. And, the, and we've seen that the correlation between those is very, very uh, strong. So actually to see the excitation to inhibition ratio uh, uh, changes, we need to be very careful with them. With the, well, That's why we use the slices. So we don't know that part yet. And, but we know that we can, uh, for example, if there are compensatory changes that are uh, from, the, from the hormones that are changing the accessory proteins, then we can, we can use proteomics to measure it. And also we can test, for example, if we have the, the, uh, this, the GABA receptors, particular, as, as you said, particularly are sensitive to the, to the hormones, so the estra, estra, estradiol and others. So we, if there are compensatory changes, that they have lower sensitization, for example, we can test directly the estradiol on these GABA receptors to see if there are changes to, on the response to that. We may, I don't know, but 
I just speculating that in, in a person that has uh, the response of estradiol of GAB receptors in not, not one person that is controlled or a male or female, may or might be a little bit different compared uh, when we tested compared to someone that has a large concentration of estradiol, for example, and may show some desensitization. So all those questions are just new to, uh, because we, to us at least with the native receptor. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Akinor. I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, it's gotten a bit late, so I think we'll actually close out the Q&A session there. Um, but Akinor, thanks so much for your really great insights today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Yeah, definitely. Big thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, and also a big thanks to Harvard Bioscience for sponsoring this event. Have a great day, everyone.